Okay, hello everybody. Here we are in Menlan. We are at the uh, uh, wonderful Tibet House U.S. country facility, healing medicine Buddha center. Behind me is the medicine Buddha, an icon with various bodhisattvas helping him out and all sorts of other people facilitating his delivery of healing energy and healing knowledge and healing wisdom, and healing insight to all the suffering, ill people. And we're now, um, uh, we, we're, we're now still in realistic speech, but we're coming to the relationship with the guru and the relationship with the teacher, and the importance of the teacher. And uh, we're, going to do, we're going to finish realistic speech this session by doing this. So realistic speech is not just preserved by cultures that but by teachers and texts. While reading from Nagarjuna's friendly letter with the good Keshala, my own personal teacher, which you know from previous mentions of him, Tanji Ledutsen I mentioned his name for a person, Skeshi Ngawang Wangel. I must was Ngawang means God of speech or, or Lord of speech and the conqueror of power, you know, controlling of his own powerfulness. That's a teacher, Geshe, and a spiritual friend, which is the relation, the basic relation in universal vehicle Buddhism of a teacher is as a good friend rather than some sort of authority figure because this is, this is emphasizing how you yourself have to come to the understanding. The teacher is like a coach. He's not, he just can't sort of implant the understanding in your mind in some way, some magical way. <clears throat> okay, I must say I felt released by hearing meditating on and discovering a bit about the four noble truths or four friendly facts. When I heard about the possibility of nirvana being not just the mental but also the physical reality of the world in Nagarjuna's non-dual vision of the ultimate unity of samsara and nirvana, I actually felt quite exhilarated from the relief of it. I mistakenly thought that I had actually attained nirvana for a while thinking that the oneness of samsara nirvana meant that the relative world disappears and you were just impersonally present in an ocean of bliss without a body. I did indeed disappear a few times, right away just hearing about it, and found it very refreshing, like a sound night's sleep. <laughs> space, like it's called in the technical language, space-like equipoised samadhi where you sort of really break free of identifying with being a being in a body. And you don't see or hear or think or anything, and you, just, you are just infinite space. And you feel that that infinite space is the real everything. You sort of vaguely remember, or in a way you kind of almost don't, but you a little bit vaguely remember, at least I did, that there was a place you left where there were lots of beings and things other beings and other things. You sort of remember, like your old body even, you remember it was there, but you don't miss it, kind of. You feel relieved from worrying about it. And so you just completely feel open space. You just space out. And you almost concretize that spacing out, almost completely. You, I think maybe some people could, actually. So maybe it's a little, maybe I could have, you know, and, but it was my teacher who helped me not to actually. So I, but I could, maybe I could have. So that's interesting. I didn't think of that quite when I was writing this, but now I'm thinking of that. Maybe I could have. Some affinity would have enabled me to, maybe. But maybe some affinity prevented me. I don't know. I can't say. But anyway, I really flipped out about it. And when I heard about the possibility of nirvana being not just the mental part, right, but also the physical reality of the world, like you physically are just space and, and, and you don't feel guilty leaving your friends and loved ones or whatever because at that age I was just 23, I was divorced, I was like whatever, you know, I was leaving the world, but Vietnam War was going on, I was too much, I was too sensitive. In Nagarjuna's non-dual vision of the ultimate unity of samsara nirvana, which I thought that was what that was, that the non-dual thing was that there's no other thing but just the space. That's what non-dual meant to me. I actually felt quite exhilarated from the relief of it. I mistakenly thought I had actually attained nirvana for a while, thinking that the oneness of samsara nirvana 
and the relative world disappears, and you are just impersonally present in an ocean of bliss without a body. I did disappear a few times and found it very refreshing, like a sound night's sleep. It was at this time that I first learned the universal vehicle concept of the Buddha's reality. I began my 60-year, still unsuccessful attempt to encompass fully their non-duality, which until now is only accessed by my educated imagination. That's the only way I can access it, is imagine it, and then try to have faith in it. But I do take some consolation in the re reasoned approach learned from the great Nagarjuna and his followers, that everything in the, in the infiniverse, as I prefer to call it, is nothing other than the Buddha's reality body. That's what it actually is. So even though I feel lost and alienated and frightened of the global apocalypse I see coming, I still feel that all will be well, even after major devastations and individual deaths and rebirths or something like that. And it was Geshe Wangya La, who first opened that door for me, for which I will forever be grateful. He was a true spiritual friend, which is what the Tibetan term Geshe really means, the Sanskrit Buddhist notion of the teacher as the gracious friend, Kalyana Mitra, that is the friend who enables you to feel grace who you feel gracious in their company. You feel grace in their company. And grace means what? You feel everything is all right, all rightness. The all rightness of everything uh, totally. But I still, at that first beginning, I located my all rightness in a place outside the world. I was ready to, and therefore he prevented me from accessing that all the time. He, I, I did, and he couldn't stop me in a way, I just did, but then he wouldn't let me systematically work only on that. That, that. I was very frustrated, I think, do I tell it here, or have I only told it in an earlier part of the book? I can't remember now, I apologize. But, but if I already told it, I'll come to it. Uh, I mean, if I haven't told it yet, I will come to it, but I'm, I just have to tell it here, which was that he pursued me, and he had clairvoyance. I got to know he had clairvoyance because he would find me any time I entered into that spaced out thing. He would find wherever I was, as I was slipping out of my body and really feeling out of it, out of it, and feeling glor glorious out of it. And he would interrupt me. You know, I just was slipping or I had already slipped. It'd shake me or the dog would nuzzle at me or something, bang the door. He would completely draw me back from going fully there. Because I think maybe he felt I was so uneducated, and I think he was right, that instead of becoming a Buddha, I would become a deity of the formless realm, which is the, what Buddha warns even the dualistic Buddhists about. He teaches the four formless realms, infinite space, infinite consciousness, seeming nothingness, absolute nothingness, and beyond consciousness and unconsciousness, beyond nothingness and somethingness, a very subtle state, very similar to clear light, but not clear light in the sense of separated clear light. A clear light that is not infusing in everything, but separated from it, which therefore is still not clear light. It's still ego-centered of the yogi experiencing it, or the god even, the yogi god or yogi human experiencing it. Still separate, like a separate state from a different state. The Vedanta people say, waking from god, Brahma's dream into Brahman's wakeful state. His dream state is where there seem to be people in the world, and because they think that's a final state. So they think Brahma is finally, uh, is finally there when he's awake, but he's somehow only an illusion when he's asleep, and the world is an illusion when he's asleep. They, they rationalize this issue like that, but actually the great ones didn't. The great ones arrived at true non-duality like Buddha's non-duality, same non-duality they arrived at. And therefore, some who wanted to be his followers rejected his final arrival and tried to put him back to where there were some absolute structures in relativity. They weren't willing to see everything relativized. As when you see it, when it's all absolute clear light, then all differences are relativized. The difference between you and Buddha is just relative. Because he's related to you. You don't feel related to him or her. You want to try to find them because you're feeling like lost and you're not enlightened. But he does feel related to you. He forced to feel you 
as you, by being one with an infinite number of beings in communion with them. them be, they being his body. Christ is teaching that in the communion, too. That's why it's a word is good to use, that word. You know, eat, of my, eat my flesh and blood. He says, eat my body, drink my blood. He says that. Stop the sacrificing and thinking that you just have scapegoats about your problems. I'm one with you in that ceremony. That's the, that is the power of that tradition. It's the same thing, actually. That means you can't be, harm anybody like him. That means you're willing to give your flesh and blood to everybody. That's like a bodhisattva is. That's what enlightenment is, but you don't have to. You want to, because that, that might be not the best way of loving them. <laughs> and become cannibals. Might not. But your willingness to be that is exemplifying the way of true altruism. You, you, they, you, they feel, okay, never mind. I don't want to go more on that. But that's, that's where it is. So, uh, in any enterprise dedicated, I want to get to this, in any enterprise dedicated to learning through realistic speech, the question of finding an appropriate teacher becomes important, since a good teacher can help a lot to intensify learning and development. A not good teacher should be someone, would be someone pretending to be more enlightened than they are. That is a really terrible crime. In mendicancy, you know, if you pretend to be more enlightened, claim an enlightenment that you don't have, then, then you lose your monastic, you lose your bhikshu vow, you lose your mendicant vow, you get kicked out of the community if you do that. In order to determine, in order to dominate others, like I'm a Buddha, so you should obey me or something. Using what is the very worst form of unrealistic speech, of lying. It, it exploits others' desire to evolve toward enlightenment by thinking that, oh, well, this person is now a Buddha, so if I just really totally depend on them, then I'll get to be one quickly and so on. And harms them by misdirecting their life's efforts, often leading them eventually to become disillusioned with the pretending pseudo-teacher, and because of that, despairing of the effectiveness of the teaching itself, and maybe of any teaching whatsoever. So, so that's really important. And like in Zen tradition, in Chan, in Zen, in Chinese, real deepest version of the Dharma that they have there, real like Madhyamaka, Super Madhyamaka, where they say, if you meet a Buddha in the road, kill him. Which doesn't mean go kill any person, but it means that Anybody pretends to be Buddha, or, or if you sort of in your own mind think that something else is the Buddha, means you're not the Buddha. It's not up to you to become that. You know, you, you are that somewhere because Buddhas all think they're you. So you have to find that level in yourself. It's, and they can't do that for you. So you can't just depend on somebody like that. So that's really the same teaching, exactly. But somebody, therefore, abusing that and, and saying, no, I'm a Buddha, don't kill me. I'm going to kill you. Then that's really bad. The evolutionary consequences of inflicting such harm are said to be extremely serious of being a bad teacher and misleading students in this particular quest of, of enlightenment, of evolutionary transcendence, of evolutionary, you know, perfection, consummation. When someone gets that ambition and then to deceive them, is really bad because it's so important to them that they have that opportunity in that, in that life, that that opportunity is not realized by them in that life, is really harming them. They may then be reborn as gorillas for a million lives or rhinoceri or worse. I feel compelled to include a note about finding a true teacher here. Uh, as a good teacher can deliver realistic and thus helpful speech to a student. A good one is important, absolutely. Any student bent on challenging even apocalyptic tantric vehicle, for example, must visualize the three jewels of Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha as embodied in a living teacher, her or his mind as a Buddha mind, speech as a Buddha's teaching, and body as a Buddha emanation. So that is, that's at the highest esoteric initiatory level where you know, you see your geisha law, your spiritual friend, okay, I'm going to project on you that your body is a Buddha emanation, your speech is Buddha teaching, Buddha himself teaching me personally, and your mind is the Buddha's mind, the Dharmakaya. And, and I don't see it that way. I see you as ordinary Joe Blow or geisha law or Miss So-and-so, 
but I'm going to project that in you, and then I'm going to really get into that. That's at the esoteric level. It takes great courage and sincerity to attempt such an imaginative transformation of the human uh, uh, reality of the teacher. The sense of immediate presence of the enlightened ideal is needed because it counters the tendency in historical religions to think that the founder is gone, the age is dark, and so the practitioner can only emulate or hope for greater progress in future lives since enlightenment is something too far away from the present situation. That's the esoteric one. That's the way I call it. You can call it the apocalyptic vehicle because it's like when Jesus is back, you know, and he's not back to kill people at all. He's back because everybody has to be Jesus. That's what that means. Not everybody doesn't have to be uh, Christian. Everybody has to be Christ. That's what it really means. You know, everybody has to be Buddha is what it really means. Okay? And, and what it means in the tantric initiation is, you, at first, it's, it's hard to see somebody else as Buddha using your imagination, but you work on it, and you get to where you, any kind of seemingly less than what you might expect the Buddha to be like thing, you feel that's just my failure to perceive. So there's like a, a vib an inner Buddha vibrating there or something by your, projected by your imagination. Your power projects him being that great because you're so deep into, you shouldn't be allowed to even get into such a mandala unless you already have a big feeling of freedom. You've, you've withdrawn your imagination from being rigidly connected to materialistic, ideologically constructed world. And you're able to really imagine something and vividly get into the imagination. You're able to, you're able to sort of move psycholo psychologically into altered states without being stuck in them, because you're not stuck in this or this state, because we're the altered state that our culture inflicts on us of being a materialistic person, like, you know, absolutely materialistic. Okay, so you shouldn't get too near, you shouldn't get into spirit, be allowed to engage in that spiritual materialism, as one of the teacher, Buddhist, great Buddhist Tibetan teachers said. Okay, crazy one, but quite great in some way. So, so, uh, but the real thing, the sense of immediate presence of the enlightened ideal is needed. And so, because, because why? Because in this life, you have to visualize yourself, imagine yourself as a Buddha. Like in Zen, just sitting, you are Buddha, be Buddha. You have to do that. That's not, that's not easy. You know, in Dzogchen in Tibetan, there's a version of Tibetan where they do that, they, they tell you you should think that way right away. Great perfection, great connection. But actually, the real word means great connection, but never mind. But great perfection, okay? So you're perfect, then you're supposed to visualize, right? But you don't feel perfect, you feel terrible, therefore, you have years of practice of what they call preliminaries. So you're sort of mentally placed in that position of pressure, of super stress, to overcome the stress of the suffering of your normal, ignorant life. And it's put like into a double bind. Your mind is put into a double bind. It puts a super pressure and responsibility on you. And to be able to bear that, you then go into start to bow down 100,000 times to an icon of a Buddha. You do offerings of the universe a hundred thousand times. You do this and that a hundred thousand times, you know. You, you repeat visualizing your guru as a Buddha a hundred thousand times, you, etc. You, you repeat visualizing all beings as already enlightened, everybody in the whole world, but you are enlightened. <laughs> you do that. It's really difficult, those preliminaries. Actually, The sense of immediate presence of the enlightened ideal is needed because it counters the tendency in historical religion to think that the founder is gone, the age is dark, and so the practitioner can only emulate or hope for great progress in future lives since enlightenment is something too far away from the present situation. Actually, the esoteric focus on the teacher merely explicates what is implied in the general universal vehicle non-dual teaching that nirvana is beginningless, the reality of the world beginninglessly the reality of the world. The Buddhas see all beings as completely one with their reality body after all. Well, all the other Buddhas are going around thinking they're Adam Foyz and our engineer and me sitting here doing this. <laughs> they think that. They feel that. They experience that. Because, which is inconceivable. How could a being be themselves other, elsewhere, somewhere, and experiencing themselves as other beings and simultaneously experiencing me in totality of the way I experience everything right now and Adam and everybody else? 
I can't even conceive of such a being. How could there be such a being? That's what's meant by inconceivable. But in a way, logically, given infinite effort and infinite opportunity and infinite situations and, and perpetual, I don't say eternal because we always think that means sort of out of time, but perpetual effort at development, anything is possible. Even the inconceivable is possible. Get it? You can't say it isn't possible. You can't quite wrap your head around it that was inconceivable, but you can't wrap your head around its absence either. Do you follow me? That's the doorway in that inconceivability for developing faith, true, self-transcending, self-transforming bhakti, faith, devotional faith. Okay? The Buddha is all see beings. It's completely one with their reality but That one is only being obscured for the unenlightened by their misknowing sense of alienation. By the unenlightened. That's what they feel. So they have a misknowing. I misknow myself and say, I'm just not silly me. I'm not somebody else. Thus the performer of the practices eventually realizes that the Buddha awareness is already within them, just hidden behind the addictive and objective veils of misknowledge. So I think my thinking, I'm Bob, my identity habit is just it's absolute. I can't possibly get away from it, I think. And I don't realize that it's something, you know, I could be a psycho. Psychologists realize this. people just lose all sense of identity in a, in a paralyzing way. They, they don't know who they are. You know, they become psychotic in that sense. And, and they, because they think it's, it's like, then they become absolutely without a sense of identity, but actually not quite, because if you kick them, they go, ow, you know. So they're identifying as having a body still. So there are layers of identity that are still there. But they haven't gone that deep, so deep, but they've gone to a degree where they're stuck in, feeling they don't know who they are. So psychologists will tell you that. And therefore, these practices are deep. You go past that, but you understand what that is. It's just possible to do that. But you don't get stuck there. The performing practices eventually realizes that the Buddha awareness is already within them. So in other words, they go there, go there, go there, and then they realize that they have infinite possibility of identifying with various ways of being. And then they realize that the Buddha awareness is so open because when you go into the space like selflessness, and if you do it in a way where you don't actually go into sort of making an identity out of not being there, you don't absolutize that state of space, then you sort of get more resilient and open and then when you come back to you being yourself as differentiated from the wall, the, the, fact that you, the fact that you are you becomes more like you're being reflected in a mirror. You're like a mirror reflection of yourself. So you're not really, you know, you're not so really you as you thought you were before. If you're less really, really, and the wall is less really, really itself as it was before. And, that, and if you deepen and gradually deepen and deepen and deepen that, you become eventually finally aware that you yourself are projecting your identity into yourself and projecting the identity of the wall into the wall. And then you become capable of projecting other things in other ways. And so you can project in yourself the identity of being a Buddha. And you can imitate the mind of being a Buddha for a certain, develop a certain sense of confidence and also a sense of duty and obligation toward the Buddha duty, which is to free other beings from suffering, to identify with them empathically. I know that's a big mouthful, but you can just follow it and just leave it. Don't, don't try to grab it, just get, because you have to get used to it. It's like slowly, uh, the wonderful thing is becoming enlightened. You know, we have this whole idea from that it's like a big explosion, and then suddenly we're going to be enlightened. Uh, but no, Atisha, the great Atisha, Bengali prince, mendicant, eventual mendicant who then came to Tibet and planted some really important seeds there in the year 1042. And uh, he said that uh, becoming, becoming a deep awareness of selflessness and emptiness of freedom, true freedom, is like melting butter in a broth or like ironing the wrinkles out of a cotton cloth with a steam, with not well, a rock, a hot rock, <laughs> an iron, slowly pressing the wrinkle out. You know, it's a gradual process. Like that. Thus, the performer is hidden behind the addictive and, and objective veils of misknowledge. So, instead of that time 
when they imagine that awareness as being there, as one with the awareness of all Buddhas, what they are imagining is what is already the case from the Buddha's own enlightened perspective. In this way, imagination serves as the template for realization. That's very interesting, and that's right, and that's good. And that's why, but, oh, never mind, I don't want to do that. Okay, so if realistic speech leads us to awakening. It is wrong to think that you can't possibly attain enlightenment because you are so weak and stupid, whereas others are great, and that you can't meet any truly enlightened person. They really are enlightened people, sensitive, compassionate, skillful. They might be people that you never know. They might be women. They might be taxi drivers. They might be saints. They might be ordinary people who seem ordinary on the outside but really are enlightened. There are many who can. They might be children. There's one sutra, very short one, where Buddha's in begging going down the street in a wealthy city, and a woman is standing on a second-floor balcony but obviously not that high a building, so she can be heard by the man walking the street. And he's walking the street, and then she's holding a two-year-old or a three-year-old, just barely learned to talk. And the three-year-old starts talking to Buddha about selflessness and emptiness, and I'm so happy to see you. And thank goodness that people, you can tell people about everybody's selfless. The baby starts talking like this. And then, oh, just, just, you don't know what you're saying, just babbling. Oh, I apologize if my child is babbling. But he says, no, he's not babbling. He's like enlightened from previous lives. He's taking teaching. He's telling me I should give some teachings. And he starts to have a dialogue with this baby. That's the one sutra. I forget the name of it. I'm sorry. But I have it in my computer, but I can't find it. It's a wonderful 84,000 people translated it. I, I couldn't believe it when I read it. I thought I'd read all the sutras, not that one. The baby is talking. Madhyamaka. So ahead of that time, when they imagine that awareness as being there, as one with the awareness of all Buddhas, what they are imagining is what is already the case from the Buddha's own enlightened perspective. In this way, imagination serves as the template for realization. That's so far out. You know, even the, those dualistic Buddhists who think that you're trying to attain a nirvana, which is leaving the world, they have these things called the kirtnayatana, the, me the totality media, mediums. And they have like the totality of earth. And so if you meditate on that earth, and all you do is think of earth in your meditation, you go one point in thinking of earth. And then it said everything is seen as dirt. So you see everything as solid earth. You reach the kirtnayatana. So in other words, they also learn the complete power of projection which is itself not absolute, though, but it's, but it's as powerful. And then that's when you realize that your ordinary habitual perception is you're partially responsible for what you see. So you're creating what you see, in a way, as what you see it. So when I see that door, it's not like that door is objectively over there, and I just read its doorness off it. That do I am creating a door out of it. I'm imagining that door, I remember it opens, I know it goes through, I remember that I walked through it before, and so I know that's a door. But I also project it as a door, I project it as a wall. And when I get really powerful, I can have super X-ray vision, I can see through the door. Because I'm projecting it as being atoms, and I'm projecting it not just as atoms, as solid. If I'm a scientist, I project it as being atoms. And then if I'm quantum, I lose all control of what I'm projecting. And that's why they would recoil from the discovery of the uncertainty principle and so forth. And they get into all crazy things about the superposition of the, of the collapse of the, of the superposition of the whatever, of, of, the, of the wave function, that's right. Wave and particle. Never mind. Or time gets involved. Never mind that. But they get into all crazy things that don't make sense. Because it doesn't make sense. Because sense is also created by our projecting. When we don't project sense into sense, it doesn't have sense <laughs> by itself. There's no intrinsic significance in things. We, can, we attribute significance. In this way, imagination serves as the template for realization, even when it's not overtly esoteric tantra. Realistic speech leads us to awakening. It is wrong to think, oh yeah, I got that. There really are, yes. But they've all... Of course, I'm not absolutely certain how enlightened they really are. Those that I have met a number, I say, I have met a number of them and have been greatly blessed. Of course, I'm not absolutely certain how enlightened they really are, since I am not fully enlightened myself yet. 
so I might be mistaken, but they, they fit all the definitions I have heard. An interesting thing that I first read in Lama Rendawa's commentary, to, to Sakya Lama Rendawa's commentary, to Nagarjuna's friendly letter to the king, is the analysis of the double bind, that you cannot realize selflessness unless you hear about it from another who has realized it. And also, you can only realize selflessness yourself. <laughs> That's really tricky. If we really unpack that. This means that the limited self-centered individual can only realize it if he or she hears it from one who has already realized it. In other words, they are having a kind of illusory self when they tell the person about it. And somehow, but being in their presence, it gives a kind of template without realizing it to the person who is rationally thinking about it, critiquing the eye, the feeling of feeling, absolutely, I'm really, really, really me. And then, the, so they get a kind of holographic template of what it feels like to feel like I'm not really me, but I am real. I am me, but not really me. I am unreally me. So it gets more relaxed about being me, in other words. It's all very subliminal at that point, but it's essential. He mentions that in that text. It's a mar marvelous passage in his text. This means that the limited self-centered individual can only realize it if he or she hears it from one who has already realized it. And then he or she can realize it similarly. It's a quadruple bind, actually. So the genuine guru or lama is essential to inspiring and motivating the disciple to fully wake up her or himself. I think that Geshe Wangyela, certainly realized a great enlightenment, and so has His Holiness Dalai Lama, as well as his teachers and some of his colleagues. Due to their kindness, I somewhat understand it too, certainly not fully, but enough to help others begin to get the point and dare to try to find it for themselves. The need for a beneficial lama is really critical, but that doesn't mean a political czar. It's worse if some kind of dominating social or political authority, if, if it parades itself as some kind of dominating social or political authority. In that sense, in the, for the Tibetans, the Dalai Lama was so happy and so excited in 2011 when he resigned from being the political leader of the Tibetan polity, even from exile, in the government in exile. He was so happy. And he said, finally, I'm not a hypocrite. He said, people didn't realize that he really meant that. I'm finally not a hypocrite. In other words, really advocating and insisting on democracy and demanding that my people get rid of their authoritarian thing if they got to follow somebody, some authority, their own little caste system there, and really taking responsibility for their judgments and their decisions and their deeds themselves, and, and, and respecting people who have more knowledge and whatever, et cetera, but not becoming overly dependent on them. And so in, the, in their society, that they are capable of democracy rather than demanding strong man. He, was, he, he, he sort of expressed his faith in his people by refusing even in a future life to hold political authority and office. And he said, yes, if I have a future life, I'll be a monk in my monastery. I'll be the, uh, you know, they can still say, oh, that's previous Dalai Lama. He's there, he's a good teacher if I become one, but I never want to have political authority. They have to elect somebody, and then they have to figure out who is good to elect, not a dictator. Don't let a person subvert the democratic process and shut it down even after having once been elected. Don't let that happen and challenge that person. Don't let any one person have that degree of power to cause violence when they get paranoid. That's, that's the danger. Now we can't have kings and dictators anymore. We cannot. Power is too great technological power. So the need for a bit is really critical, but that doesn't mean a political czar. It's worse if it's some kind of dominating social or political authority. In that sense, I prefer to refer to teachers as opposed to masters, although I admit you can say master carpenter, master tailor, etc. So you should also be able to say master teacher, yes. Okay. If we, but once we have made it not really master, master, but not really. Keshe Moyer is so brilliant. He used to say, people are not wrong when they think they're real. But when they start thinking they're really real, that's when they go astray. That's really good. That's what happens to dictators. They think they're really real, so nobody can get along without them. So they should kill everybody who doesn't 
only cater to them. And then that's terrible, given the mechanism of control and, and destruction. Okay? In Tibetan Buddhism, this word lama has a different emphasis than in the Sanskrit term guru does in Vedism and Hinduism. In Sanskrit, guru means heavy. And in Hinduism, there is this heavyweight connotation of guru derived from the cultural weight connotation of guru, the cultural weight of the patriarchal father figure, the head of the family. The guru is a heavy weight on your head, a religious authority, a boss-like figure. But a lama should not be heavy. He or she is lana mepa, Sanskrit anuttara, someone beyond whom you cannot go. You cannot get beyond her or him because she or he is envisioned as a doorway to omnipresent nirvana and Buddhahood. Instead of a boss on top, the lama is like a flypaper on which you get stuck. You can't get beyond it. You are automatically opened in the field of such an enlightened open being, and you become even freer by connecting to the transparency of your own self. So your self-habits can dissolve more easily, your identity habits. A great example of the subtleties of a teacher and their realistic speech is a scene from the first American Kalachakra initiation in 1981 in Madison, Wisconsin. The Dalai Lama had finished a main part of the initiation, and he put on a certain ceremonial hat, turned gravely toward his, all, toward all of the students, all the initiates, and said ceremoniously, now I'm your guru, and you have to do what I say. Then he took off the hat, complained about having to wear it, scratched his head, and added in a completely conversational tone, Except if what I say is stupid, never mind. Just forget about it. <laughs> Some of us laughed and enjoyed the relief. But many people were chagrined. I noticed to my surprise in the audience. They just couldn't bear this abrupt turnabout. They wanted to maintain the spell, the magical feeling of solemn presence, the secure feeling of dependence, Absolute dependence on absolute authority. But His Holiness was doing the honest thing. He was liberating from the absolutizing of authority. You know, we Americans especially, we think we are radical individuals, this and that. But meanwhile, we worship authority. We are very authoritarian. We, we, we want to elect a strong man, many of us. We want a boss. We want... Somebody beat us up if we go wrong. Oh, no, that they were too, they spoiled me too much. They didn't beat me up, you know, to make me do good. So I, now I don't do good. Baloney. But then, never mind. But there was, then there was the example of my first teacher again, Geshe Wanjala. Oh, now I'm telling the story. Oh, good. I can't tell you how many people I saw in New Jersey who came to be his disciples and whom he sent back to independently face their lives. He never kept someone who he thought he was not helping. Geshe Wandela passed away in 1983, and until the end, I remained connected with him, visited him as a friend, and he did a lot for me. For instance, he asked his students to pray for me so that I would get tenure at my college. <laughs> they were furious, actually. When I saw them, they would say, oh, so do you have tenure now? We're so tired of praying for you every morning. <laughs> he was my real spiritual father. That's why I say that Kimball Ngawan Dorjeev, who was his teacher, was my spiritual grandfather. I don't think of myself only as the biological child of my father, gentle descendant of a redneck clan from Mississippi and numerous generals produced at West Point. I also think of myself as a spiritual child of the venerable Geshe Wanjala, Dangelero Tsenimute. Speak, speech is a magnificent thing. That's why they say the greatest thing a Buddha does is teach and speak, because what, what do we do when we speak? When we have a conversation, when you speak to me, your mind is shared with me. You share your mind with me when you speak to me. When I speak to you, I share my mind with you. So in a way, when we listen to each other, we open our mind to each other. We give them the privilege of entering our mind by saying something, to treat our speech it, as such rehabilitates it so that it becomes truly realistic. After this rehabilitation of speech as realistic speech, highlighting the central role of education, 
we can turn to the evolutionary causality analysis for the conscious evolutionary ethical development of our full body and mind as well as speech. That's cool. I got to more pages that time. How long was that? That was only 45 minutes. That was good. So good. So, so we are now up at the beginning uh, for the next session. I'm not going to go into it in too much detail, but I'm going to recapitulate a little bit of that. I'm amazed. I, did I hope I didn't skip a page. No, I didn't. I got because I, I talked in some personal stories, so it went more qu quickly. Next chapter is entitled Realistic Ethical Evolutionary Action, where we have a Darwin that connects to ethics, which is the theory of karma. And I think I'm maybe the first person in the Western culture who has said that like that. And, and I think I can defend it philosophically and scientifically, actually. So, but never mind. And, uh, and we will do that next session. And I'm thrilled about it. And uh, I'm thrilled we got, through, we got through realistic speech. And I think we did it about it. And, um, and uh, this is hopefully helping you be more lucid in your speech. And be aware that your speech is very, very powerful. And again, let's mention democracy just at the end. What is the sort of most powerful democratic speech? It is when you vote. When you have a free vote, nobody's coercing you, and you have a choice. And there are different people who have, and, and you're not just choosing because you like them or dislike them, although intuition can help sometimes. But your main thing is, what are they going to do? You have evidence that they plan to They tell you, of course. But you also know, you, if you informed yourself, if you know how powerful that speech is, you inform yourself of what these people have done in their lives. Have they, in fact, been helpful to other people? If you're going to be sort of below them socially in the sense of subjected to the effects of their policies, then what have their policies been in the past when they've been in positions of authority? Have they paid their employees? Have they been fair to their employees? Have they been kind to their employees? Are they respectful to their employees or have they not been so? If they're business people, if they're political people, have they fulfilled their promises? Have they done useful things? Have they raised set minimum wages? Have they, have they controlled the working conditions to make it safe? Have they shared and, you know, have they dealt properly with people seeking asylum here or opportunity? Have they Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Have they allowed? Have they sold out to been bribed by people and so forth? Look and in, look into them, and then you give your most powerful speech. You say, "I select you to govern the society I'm living in. I select you as chief of police, as mayor, as judge, as governor, as state senator, state assemblyman, uh, assembly person, as president, as co senator, as." Congress representative, I select all of you because I've studied the thing and I, or, or people that I have studied or good at it have taught me, I take their word for it maybe if I have any time to study everyone. But that is powerful speech. And, you know, we are talking our way through the day and a lot of our attitude is controlled by what we tell ourselves. You're a good person, Bob. You can do that. Yeah, you feel, well, you can't right away, but you have to learn. You can learn to do it. You should do that. You're not, somebody said you're a jerk and you can never do this. Don't accept that. Well, sometimes you really can't do something but right away, so you can accept that. I mean, you, we talk our way around. You know, I can feel better. I can take this. I can do some exercise today. I can do the other. And then you do it. And you, or you, somebody, you internalize some people telling you you're a jerk, you're stupid, you could never do that. Oh, you're a lay, you're a girl, you can't do math. Oh, you're this. And then, oh, yeah, I can't do that. I can't. You, you have these voices are in your mind. And so that's when you have a motive to look at your mind, how it works. You develop your mindfulness, your self awareness. And we'll come into that. We deal a lot, a lot later. So I don't want to pre, presuppose that. But uh, this, is, this realistic speech is very, purposefully put there as a very important level of realism to add to your realism. And then you won't lightly take, a, you won't lightly lie. You might still use a white lie if it's helpful to help some, save someone's feelings or to protect someone else, that's possible. You might 
divide. You might tell somebody somebody else is kind of after them and really they're not their friend if that's really a fact. And they're being abused by somebody, some narcissistic person abusing somebody else. You might say, well, look, that person really is not nice to you. As a therapist, you do that. And that's not divisive speech. In that case, you're helping them defend themselves. That's OK. But otherwise, you always make peace between people. Oh, that person's really nice. They have a good side. You should see it that way. And that's the better way to do. Then you can speak sweetly. If you, know, if you can write, you write poetry. You write well. You speak well. And you speak sweetly. You say what makes people happy. You sing to them. You write a poem. Or you, sometimes you have to scold them. Sometimes you have to say, don't do that. Careful, careful. Shout at them. And it's not abusive then if you speak harshly. Because your baby is about to stick their finger in a socket or something, electric socket. Say, don't touch that. You can shout. But mostly you sweetly speak. And then you, you don't just babble nonsense. You, you, when, or pretend to know. The worst nonsense is to pretend you know something that you don't. And to sort of you try to act pompous. Oh, yeah, that's what you should do. And you don't really know that. You don't do that. So you meaningfully speak. Well, I, and if you don't know, you say, I don't know. That's meaningful. And that's really good. So you try those four things, and, but you, you mainly really respect the word and learning. And you try to educate yourself always more. You respect speech. And you know that speech is, and even in the context that you know that speech is never perfect. You don't become dogmatic and fanatic about certain slogans and things. But you respect its power. That's the key thing. That's realistic speech. Okay? Thank you so much. And Manjushri is the greatest of speakers, of course. Manjushri, gentle glory. And we speak so sweetly and gently, Manjushri. And why can he do that? Because Manjushri is speaking to a student. And this is, this is really, it should be essential to all teachers. Any teacher who thinks when they look at a student, that person can't learn. That person is some lowly thing. They have no intelligence. They just absolutely can't learn. That's not a good teacher. They are projecting on that student that the student can't learn, is not able to learn, has no Buddha in the case of spirituality. They have no Buddha nature. They have no Christ nature. They're condemned. That's not good. That's evil, actually. Because that's trapping that person in a state and maybe they are very humble about, oh, I'm not that smart or something. Because other people have pushed them and classified them in such a way that they can't, uh, you, oh, you can't do that. You know, there are studies that show that even elementary school teachers, and there's a racist thing about it, white teachers, uh, black students, they project on them that they can't really learn this or that. And it has that effect. And they, 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 that student will show less good score. They're not even violent to them or mean to them or abusive to them. But they just think they can't learn. So they sort of don't really direct the, the optimism or the, the, little, the little flick, the little like cue that they're going to know. And they put them pet, have some other teacher's pet that they think is going to know. And that one does learn better. So teachers should always feel they are educating bringing out the inner knowledge of the student. And, it, and what they're doing is about the student. And what they do should adapt to the ability of the student. And, and you know, maybe that doesn't mean they can't judge, oh, this is, this is too advanced for this one at that time. Or this would be confusing to the other one at that time. Buddha himself did that. He, he said he didn't want Mahayana non-duality widespread and published wide in, in India, in the human plane, for 400 years. But after 400 years, then the human beings would be ready for it. And the Nagas, and then he entrusted the scriptures to the Nagas, whatever that means, to the dragons, and then said they would bring it back to the humans later. I don't know what that means. It's a fun myth, though. So, OK, so this, this is what I try to do. I, so I, when I say, let us all become mandra, let us dedicate the merit. You have a merit if you've listened to me for a period of time. I have a merit of trying to speak in some way of being relevant to you. And in this case, I'm recording something, so I don't know exactly who you're going to be, although I can assume you wouldn't bother with something I said unless you had a certain aptitude and affinity. So that gives me a little. And also, about the deepest teaching about selflessness, I just want to say this. 
there is a famous thing of Nagarjuna saying, be careful about emptiness or selflessness because it can lead to people having experiences of loss of identity and then they become nihilistic. But you know what? Everyone in our society is quite nihilistic, is the thing. So we do need the hammer of freedom, emptiness, selflessness, negation, and be able to see that it's not, we don't disappear when we let go of our whatever sense of identity. So then it becomes gradually less and less rigid. So we, it's, it's, a, it's not that dangerous for us because we've already been trapped by the danger, if you follow me, which is the danger of nihilism, which is the paralysis that you have when you think that nothing you do matters. When meanwhile, it's everything you do matters, totally. Because every cause can have infinite consequence in a perpetual universe and, a, and, a, and an infinite space and a perpetual time where you remain, you and what you do, through what you do, as what you do, you remain, in, by thinking, speaking, and, and physically acting, everything that you do has a, has a part of an infinite flow. So you're, you're here for the duration. And the duration is perpetual. That's really important to know. OK? So that dedication is important. We place the dedication in the flow to go with us perpetually when we dedicate some good thing that we do and congratulate ourselves that way from doing it and bring its good effect with us. Don't put it somewhere by, through pride or whatever it is, arrogance in some, some place where they get lost, some little ego world, okay? So all the best, and thank you, Adam Foyzen, for hanging in there and, and uh, producing this with me, okay? All the best.